Good evening, brothers. Welcome to Theology Friday once again. We're going to be uh, having another, uh, hopefully, a good study in the Word of God and uh, understanding uh, the Lord's will, uh, not only in our lives, but in terms of what He seeks to teach us His doctrine. And I want to begin uh, with prayer, beginning always uh, with the hand of the Holy Spirit to be upon us, helping us to clarify these things for us and show its usefulness in our lives. Blessed Father, we glorify your name, knowing that indeed you are our God, that you have called us out, Father, from the world, so that we would have true understanding, Father, for the world does not see you, Father. It seeks to know things most of the time, Father, through materialism, for what they can perceive, Lord, and by the darkness of their own minds and their own thoughts. I pray that today, Father, we would bring some light, Father, as you shine a light upon us through your word, through the understanding, Father, and particularly the plan that you have, Father, to bring redemption, Father, to humanity, to redeem that which was lost, Father, to not just condemn us all, Father, to hell, but to be able to have the opportunity to have life and have it abundantly, and most of all, to know you, Lord, and because we want to know you and we want to glorify your name and in you be glorified, Lord then we ask you to be able to once again open up our eyes, open up our minds, Lord, open up our hearts so that we would be able to do this, Lord, with the full man that you've made us, Lord. So we just ask you today, be in our presence and with all those, Father, that are watching, that they may be blessed with the study and that we would be able to give the honor that is deserved to you, Father. For we ask it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So our study for today is actually going to be involving covenant theology. As many of you already know, our church is a confessional church. We follow the uh, 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is a covenantal document. It embraces covenant theology. Most of the churches out there uh, today follow what is called dispensationalism, in that God... Uh, gave different dispensations throughout history. So there was a time, a plan for for different times and, and God dealing with men with uh, in different ways and in different times. What we're looking for in covenant theology is actually looking at the fact that God determined from time past what his plan would be amongst the Trinity itself, amongst the members of the Trinity, how they would uh, bring about the redemption of man. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And we've uh, given out these sheets. So for those of you who have the sheets, we're going to begin with uh, point one, which is an explanation of what is covenant theology. If someone would uh, read it, please, out loud. Covenant theology is God's redemptive plan for humanity through covenants accomplished through his anointed Messiah. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, 2 Corinthians 1. Amen. So in other words, covenant theology is God's plan for, hum for humanity through the use of covenants. Because our God is a covenantal God. And so what we want to look at is the scriptures uh, that show this. So why don't we go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 5. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 5, read as follows. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So what do we learn in this text? That the plan of God was something that was actually determined before even the world was created. And who does it culminate in? It culminates in Christ. And it speaks of our adoption. 
So, from time past, God determined what would be the outcome of history, what he would do in terms of our salvation. Let us look at uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 20, please. <clears throat> verse 20 reads as follows. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. 21 reads, And it is God who establishes us with Christ and has anointed us and has put his seal on us and given us a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So once again, we see that the plan of God from the beginning was through the Messiah to bring reconciliation and bring redemption. Let us now look at uh, the second point. If someone else could read that out loud. God's plan is revealed through the different biblical covenants with his chosen. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. So let us turn there. And the idea being here that if when we look at scripture, we're seeing that the covenants are actually revealing the plan of God. And we're going to uh, be taking a look at uh, what uh, Hebrews, uh, what the author of Hebrews uh, tells us uh, about that. When we look at verse 1, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. That, that actually includes uh, verse 2. But my point being that we can see that there is a revelation that God is bringing about through time. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't have the verse with me, but in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet speaks about how God is revealing bit by bit uh, through precept precept upon precept his uh, his will and so the concept of covenant of having an overarching we would call an overarching covenant in other words uh, the idea that God has already had a a promise or a plan from before time while the scripture doesn't use that specific language for that we're seeing that the scriptures lead to that we're looking at uh, no, point number three now. I'll go ahead and read that. It reads, The nature of God's work and the use of signs are to be understood by what he has revealed on earth. And the point to this is that in part of, of, of the use of the covenants, because many times the covenants have signs, and that's actually a way in which God is showing us, showing us his will, showing us what he is accomplishing. And the different covenants have uh, uh, bring to us that. And we want to look again at, at the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at chapter 8 now, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 6. So Hebrews chapter 8, verses 3 to, six, 3 to 6, read as follows. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth... He would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve as a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, 
He was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as, as the covenant he mediates better. Excuse me. Obtain the a ministry that is in as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. And the point being here that when we what this is a very important point of the book of Hebrews, which is that when we look at, for instance, in particular, the law of Moses, we see a law that has many different uh, practices and um, ceremonies that. We might find peculiar, there's also these uh, uh, particular restrictions within the dietary laws and things that may seem strange to us. But uh, to the people of Israel, it probably was not very strange because the Lord actually declared, I was reading, uh, I've been reading actually from the book of Ezekiel and there was a particular chapter there in which God declares that the reason why he gave his law was to make his people different different from the nations and in essence to protect them from the nations so this is actually a way in which these earthly things by doing these earthly practices having the the temple you know the uh the the tabernacle these are things that are physical heavenly things i mean physical things actually that that are representing realities of heaven and so we see that uh through the use of the covenants it basically does the same thing. It's giving us a picture of the realities of heaven, of what God is, is accomplishing through history. Let us look now at uh, point number four. The nature of redemption tells us it is effective only to those whom the promises are given. Therefore, the work of Christ is not for all, but the chosen. As a Reformed, uh, Reformed Baptist Church here, we, we obviously have a, a Calvinistic point of view when it comes to the issue of election and God's salvation. We do not believe in synergism. We believe that the work of salvation is alone for God. That's why for, to God alone is the glory. And so one of the things that we see is that the nature of the covenants is that they are for who? Who receives the promises of the covenants? The elect. The elect, the chosen, right? If, if it was for all, then all should receive it, right? But, are all, but do we know that all will receive that? When, if God is, says he makes a land promise, you have to be alive to do that. Will everyone be alive? Will everyone uh, re receive uh, eternal life in the resurrection? No. So these are promises that we see that are very particular. So in the covenants, we see that even... This particular concept is being shown to us through the concept of covenants. So let us go now to Romans 4, and we're going to be reading through verses 13 through 16. Romans 4, 13 through 16. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. So what do we see here? We see Paul actually making a very important point, which is when we speak of the people of God, who do, who do most of the time people think of? We think of the Israelites because God called them out. And who are they the descendants of? The descendants of Abraham. 
right? But we see here that when God called out Abraham, it wasn't uh, it wasn't just physical seed that he was concerned with, right? He was actually con uh, concerned with those that were a people of faith. So he's making the point that those who the law was given to, which was Israel, right? Because the Gentiles did not receive the law of Moses, that that law is not was not the intent in which God had to save the people. Because if not, it would only be for them. And it would be through the uh, following of the law that they could reach uh, salvation. And we see that actually what this is telling us is that it is, it is actually a curse. Why? Because no one is able to fulfill all the law. So that's something that we know. So how, how do we attain? So how do we attain this, this uh, great salvation? In the same way that Father Abraham did. Through faith. Let us go now to Galatians uh, chapter 3, looking at verses 26 through 29. Did I say Galatians 6? 3. 3. Okay, sorry. I thought I said 6. So yeah, so yeah, so it's actually Galatians, yeah, chapter three, and we're gonna look at verses uh, twenty-six or twenty-nine, mm -hmm. reading as follows: But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. It was up to uh, twenty-nine, right? Yeah. So you got to continue here. Let's see. So, so, so there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So we see again how the, how the covenant once again points to who it's for. Who is it for? For the people of faith. It even speaks here as being a, obviously a Baptist church. This is an important point to us that it makes a point that uh, we are baptized in who? Christ. In Christ. So it is those that are baptized in Christ who have the faith of which we are sons, sons of Abraham. Amen. Going now to, uh, we're going to be looking at point five. If someone could read uh, five, it's going to be a bit of a long paragraph, and we're going to go through some of those scriptures. But I appreciate if someone could just read right through it. You don't have to quote the verses if you don't if you don't uh, if you don't desire. Signs work as forms of assurances that God promises will come to pass. Ephesians 1, 13 and fourteen. Abraham. Uh, Abraham God. Yeah, Abraham God gave the sign. It should have been to Abraham. Sorry. Okay, got it. Yeah. To Abraham, God gave the sign of circumcision for the promise that he would be a father of nations, and he as well as his descendants were to receive the land he promised. Genesis 17, 4 through 8. By land, understanding the eternal city made by God. Hebrews 11, 9 to 10. As Paul points out in the election, Isaac and Jacob in Romans 9, of how not all Israel is of Israel. Not all receive the promises. So in other words, in the first statement that signs work as forms of assurances that God promises will come to pass is that by him establishing the covenants, that's his way of letting us know that this is something that he will do. And the signs are actually these acts, these going back to the point that I had made, which is that he gives us earthly things in order to uh, teach us these things, we see that the signs point to these things. So if we go ahead and uh, look at Ephesians 1, uh, verses uh, 13 through 14, it, it actually makes uh, this particular point. So 
So 13 and 14 read, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is what? The guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we see that even the giving of the Holy Spirit itself is a, is a sign, is a sign to us that God will do what, what he says. And the second point, uh, let us turn to Genesis 17. We're going to look at verses uh, 4 through 8, and we're going to be looking at how uh, the sign of circumcision is a way in which God actually uh, sh uh, reminds us or, or, or gives the guarantee of, of that particular promise that he gave to Abraham. If someone else could read uh, chapter 17, verses 4 through 8. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So do we see here how God is making a, a, very, a very strong promise? Basically telling Abraham, he's going to be the possessor of this promised land that he's giving him. But not only him, but also those who would be his offspring. Right? And it says that it's a, what kind of covenant is that covenant? It's an eternal covenant. So this is something that has to have an, et an eternal um, uh, and it, it's an eternal inheritance. So once again, we see the nature of how God determines determines things. He's the one who makes these things come about. And from what I understand in the Hebrew, Abram actually meant father of a nation, which was for, which of course was very uh, a very funny name to give someone who couldn't bear children with his wife. And it was to him who was promised, you know, that, that he would have a child. And we see now that this uh, covenant is being given regarding his descendants. It actually, it actually even takes his name and changes it to Abraham, which actually means father of many nations. This is already showing us, in essence, the work of the gospel. Because what did the gospel do? What did, what did the new covenant do? It brought salvation to the house of Israel and who else? To those, to those of us that were far off or those of us that are Gentiles. We are the people that are far off. So we see here that even from the very beginning, it was the intention of God to bring about this eternal inheritance, not merely for the people that are physically the descendants of Abraham, of Abraham or Abraham, but also to those who follow in, in the faith. And so circumcision was a symbol of that particular promise. Now I'd like us to turn to Hebrews 11, 9 to 10 to uh, make a specific point about this particular land promise. Yeah, one thing they did not do that I think would have been helpful is that we know that God made a promise to the Israelites to gain the land of Canaan. <clears throat> and I believe he even told them the outstretches of what they would take. And Joshua was detrimental to that. He was, he was basically the leader that God used uh, to give them this land. 
And it's very important because actually in the book, in the book of Joshua, I didn't I didn't get the references because I, I didn't realize that this is a good point to make, but it actually speaks there that Joshua makes a point that all that the Lord had said that they would receive, they received it. That the Lord was faithful and they had received it. So I know that there are those that are concerned with the land, the physical land promises that, that God gave, and those were actually fulfilled. But what I like is that the that the uh, the book of Hebrews shows us that that particular promise that was given to Abraham and to his descendants, and particularly Isaac and Jacob, was not understood to be that mere physical land. It had heavenly, heavenly, heavenly realities. The heavenly reality being that they understood that they were going to have a land that would be eternal. So let us read. Uh, Go ahead and read out uh, 11, 9, and 10. If someone could read those verses, please. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So we see here that they're looking for what? In other words, they weren't looking for the Jerusalem that was made at that time, or even now, or even now. They're looking for the new Jerusalem. And that new Jerusalem, that's the, that's the one that we, we as Gentiles, along with, with fellow Jews, are looking, are looking to that. That's why uh, the scriptures actually state that, that the, uh, the gospel is first to be preached to who? To the Jews. Because theirs were, was uh, were, were given the promises, but because of the of the of that very uh, covenant, that very sign that was given to to uh, Abraham, we we uh, we uh, we partake of that, and uh, that that point is actually further made in Romans nine. We're not going to read it, but I'm just going to read the that particular point when it where it speaks of of uh, of Paul pointing out that you know that that it was in uh, in Isaac and in Jacob. In which the promises were given, right? Because we know that Abraham had other, he had other children, and in particular, he had Ishmael before he had Isaac. But yet, even though he was even circumcised, was Ishmael uh, a son of promise? No. No. So it shows us that it. So, so it's not the physical. The reality is not in the physical. It has to do with the heavenly, and that's and that's what we see in God's plan. That God's plan for. This for us here, for, the, for us on earth, is not to to look to life in this in this particular world, which we know is going to perish. If anything, we're seeing what that the plan of God is to, in essence, reveal to us, to teach us through what's what's happened, you know, upon the earth. So let us now go ahead and uh, examine in covenant theology. There are th what we would call the overarching covenant. Now, what this means is that these are the particular plans that flow out throughout history. And so the covenants, uh, some of the covenants actually have a relationship according to that. The first one being, when we look at the, for those of you who have the sheet, uh, the first one is the covenant of redemption. And that's actually making the point of, once again, the persons of the Trinity coming together. Determining and making and, and, and being of one will and one mind to saving man. And Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, uh, gives us an insight into that. Let's go ahead and turn there. Three and four, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So the plan of God all along was to bring us to redemption. Why? Because he wants a holy people. He wants us to be a... Uh, a blameless and, and, and holy people but if we uh, sinned in our father Adam and obviously even within ourselves we sin how, how would God accomplish that 
He couldn't have accomplished it through man. It had to be done through his determination. The next covenant is the covenant of works. And that's actually what we see at the beginning in Genesis when God made man. So let us look at Genesis 2, uh, 15 through 17, which establishes that. Fifteen through seventeen reads, The Lord God took man and put him in the garden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. You shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. So the reason that we call this a covenant of works is because God is establishing his, his law, his plan when he, when he made man. The, the book of, uh, I believe it's the, the, book, the, the book of Proverbs tells us that when God made man, he made him <coughs> upright. But it's man who sinned. And so the intention of God was to make man a holy, a holy man. Because after all, in whose image were we made? We were made in the image of God. And God is holy. But we see here that by giving him this particular <laughs> law, by telling him, look, you can, as you're working, you know, you, you work the land, live in it, eat of every tree, but the one tree they could not eat. And yet, what happened? They went ahead and they ate of it. And by eating of it, they broke the covenant, the covenant of works. So, because they 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 work they uh, they broke that covenant, <coughs> that what is it? What was the penalty of that? Right. Death. And so that's and so so Genesis two is what reveals to us that beginning covenant. I think also the uh, Mosaic covenant is also a form of that, because if you look at it, what did God do with His people? He called them, gave them His law, told them, do this, and you will be blessed and you will prosper throughout the land. If you don't do this, cursed you will be, and actually you will actually be kicked out of them. So that's very much a, a picture of this overarching reality, right? Because in the end, what happens? If we, if we sin, we die, and we have no part in the life that God intended for man. But because of Jesus Christ, we're able to be redeemed, and we obtain that promise of being able to have that ultimate fulfillment of having immortality and enjoying God forever. The, uh, the last overarching uh, covenant would be the covenant of grace, which is, uh, which some call also the covenant of salvation, which is the way in which God is redeeming us. And that is first introduced in Genesis 3.15. And, and this is actually something that was revealed to Eve when, uh, when, when he was, when at the fall, when God spoke to Eve and the serpent as well. So let us turn to Genesis 3, 15. And if someone could read that for us, please. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we see here that already, while... Everyone's supposed to be a sinner because we were born we were born in sin, yet we see here that even though it doesn't say here, it doesn't use those words, those particular words of redemption, what are we seeing? We see that there's an enmity. There's a war. A war that begins. A war of good and evil. Why? Because God is, is going to bring about that seed, which we know is Christ, to bring about holiness, to bring about about goodness. And the seed of the serpent being the children of sin. And so the, the, the offspring of the woman, which is actually, which in this case, actually, even though it's speaking of Eve, it would be speaking of man. So it, still, it would still fall under, under the headship of Adam because Adam was, was, over, was over Eve. We see that, that the intent of God <coughs> was to bring a people. And this is actually shows that there is also particular redemption because it is not for all, right? 
because it's not only the woman that has offspring, but also the serpent. So that implies that not all will be receiving these promises. Jeremiah, let's go to Jeremiah 31, which actually speaks of the new covenant and its nature. It's actually 3131. And we're going to read verses 31 through, through 34. Reading as follows. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write on their hearts, I write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No, no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So if you look at the language here, it's, it's very, very clear in, in the intent of God. First, one of the things that I want to point out is notice how it says, uh, you're not to teach someone to know the Lord. <coughs> and when it uses the word know here, it uses it in that, in that relational concept. So it's not like, oh, okay, I'm going to teach you that there's a God. You know, or that we know. No, it's actually about having a relation with the Lord. The nature of the new covenant is one in which we know the Lord. In which God has done what? He's given us a, a new heart, a new spirit, as it, as it speaks in, uh, in the book of Ezekiel. And he writes his law is written where? In our hearts. And we see, so we see the difference. We see, we see that, you know, in, in, the, in the Mosaic covenant, you have the, the law being given. It's, it, you know, they're supposed to follow it. They're supposed to learn about it. You're supposed to, you know, teach it to your children. It even speaks of, you know, put it on your, on the palms of your hands, you know, put it on your forehead, you know, to meditate uh, day and night with it. Why? Because they, they were supposed to <coughs> seek it and, and, and do it. But we see that in the nature of the new covenant that is no longer necessary. Because it is who, who, does, who is doing this. It's God, you know. So we see that the work of the new covenant is a work of grace, right? Because we don't. It's, it's unlike unlike the Mosaic covenant. We're not trying to earn it. We receive it. We attain it. It's a work of God. Now the better question now would be, why did God then give the Mosaic law? Because after all, redemption did not come through that, right? And they not, they did not receive life through it. The important thing of the law of Moses is that it teaches us the character of God. It's teaching us what is right and what is wrong. In the in the uh, statements of the Ten Commandments, we have the principle, the measure by which God is going to judge man. When we stand before Him, the, it's the Ten Commandments that, that shows us what God is going to judge us according to. And so, once again, we see this earthly, earthly reality that God is using. To teach us about himself, about his will, his desire, and what he requires of man, and what he can give to man, because in the blessings that those are also a type of the blessings that are to come. But of course, what we will, as Paul says, what we will receive and from heaven, you know, will be far more glorious than what we get here on earth. Uh, I think this is a good area to go ahead and end the study. We'll continue next week on on the uh, successive covenants. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the more specific covenants, uh, the, uh, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with uh, David, and we're going to learn a little more about uh, those specifics. I want to go ahead and uh, open it up to any questions that you brothers might have or any comments.
or anything that you feel that you can add to the study. Kevin, thanks for watching. If you have been blessed by this video, please like and share it on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Acts Reform Fellowship, where we have many more biblical-based sermons and lectures. Click on the bell to be notified below when the new videos are added. Thank you and God bless.